Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Tracy Alexander. And coming up in today's newscast. The date is set, but what will happen as Netanyahu fails to get Gantz on board with plans to expand the country's sovereignty come July 1? No smashing of plates, just the COVID-19 handshake as the Greek Prime Minister arrives in Israel. We'll tell you when the airways are set to reopen into both countries. And an overwhelming sight. Sperm whales are spotted off Israel's northern coast for the first time in nearly 30 years. in southern Israel after a rocket was fired from the Gaza Strip into Israeli territory overnight. Sirens wailing across areas bordering the coastal enclave with the rockets striking an empty field in the Eshkol region. Israel's defence force retaliating to the rocket attack, striking Hamas sites in northern Gaza with tanks and aircraft. Terror groups in the Strip are increasingly threatening Israel over delays in the transfer of Qatari aid money to Gaza, which ended yesterday, and over the Israeli government's plans to expand its sovereignty over parts of Judea and Samaria. Now, the Palestinians might be against it. The European Union might be in opposition too. U.S. Democratic lawmakers might be criticising it and Arab nations, unsurprisingly, might be sounding warnings. But if the Israeli Prime Minister wants to get his annexation plans across the line, the most important people to convince are, in fact, his coalition partners. Because without an agreement between them and still no final map, well, Netanyahu's plans to make a move at the beginning of next month are slowly fading. Here's more. The Israeli Prime Minister is not backing down, but US support for Benjamin Netanyahu's West Bank unilateral expansion plan is hanging in the balance. The Premier confirming reports Monday that the Trump administration's peace team wants to see a unified position between the leaders of Israel's unity party before it will support the move. The alternate Prime Minister Benny Gantz speaking with the American Jewish Committee overnight, sharing his long-known stance on the US Peace for Prosperity plan. It gives us a realistic approach of how a stable future should look like. Uh, and I intend to promote it as much as I can in a most responsible way. But an agreement hasn't been reached between Netanyahu and coalition partners Gantz and former minister Gabi Ashkenazi over how to move ahead with the plan's offer for Israel to apply Israeli law over some 30% of Judea and Samaria. It's a baseline to continue from. Uh, and all in all, I think it's a great plan and uh, we have to work on the basis of it and we have to move forward with regional partners, with local partners and of course uh, with consensus within the Israeli society and with full coordination and acceptance of the backup we need from the United States. Gantz's Blue and White Party is saying it cannot form a position on the plan since Netanyahu hasn't outlined it clearly. That's according to multiple Hebrew media reports. In a bid to bridge the gap, a second meeting in as many days between the leaders and US Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman. So far, the inability to agree means the move will likely happen in stages. Reports also the expansion move could be pushed later than July 1, since the US-Israeli Mapping Committee hasn't finalised the plan. This amidst Palestinian media reports that Israeli-Jordan ties are extremely tense, Jordan's King Abdullah II refusing to take calls from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and Amman is refusing to set a date to meet with Gantz. But perhaps Netanyahu can find a friend in Greece, with the Prime Minister arriving in Israel today to discuss both the annexation plans and tourism in the wake of COVID-19. Kyriakos Mitsotakis avoiding the topic entirely, though, in his press conference in Jerusalem. It's a project called the American Road, and building for it is already underway. The bypass road will connect Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria with Jerusalem, as well as cut travel times for East Jerusalem neighbourhoods to the capital city. With a construction price tag of $250 million, it's said to be completed in the summer of 2021. So why is it called the American Road? Well, a US company began working on a road that winds through southeast Jerusalem back in the 1960s, but construction stopped after the 1967 Six-Day War. 
The Palestinian Minister of Jerusalem Affairs is saying that the road cuts off Palestinian neighbourhoods within the city from one another. But Jerusalem officials are saying that the thoroughfare will benefit both Jewish and Arab residents of Jerusalem. And more building is set to get underway, this time in the Golan Heights, with Israel beginning to prepare construction of a new settlement named after the US president called Trump Heights. In Hebrew, it's called Ramat Trump. In 2019, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's then cabinet decided to give it this name after US President Donald Trump recognised Israel's sovereignty over the strategic plateau. Reports say the current cabinet is set to approve an initial budget of 8 million shekels or $2.3 million to develop the settlement and 120 families are set to live there. A political victory for Israel's blue and white party. It succeeded in passing the expanded Norwegian law into the Knesset plenum in a landslide vote of 67 to 23. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu decided to skip the vote. But why? And what does this new law allow? Aaron Porras has the details. <laughs> והצעת חוק הכנסת תיקון מספר 47 התקבלה בקריאה השלישית ונכנסה לספר החוקים. Wishes coming true with a narrow 55% majority vote. Alternate Prime Minister Benny Gantz's Blue and White Party has received its demands. The so-called Norwegian law is set to become law. With this, cabinet ministers can now give up their spot in the 120-member parliament to focus solely on their ministry positions while other coalition members down the list take their place in the Knesset. But everything at a price. Working opposite leading Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in the unity government, support for the Norwegian law means reopening the unity agreement to amend a part of the power-sharing deal. As part of the original agreement, Gantz would immediately take over as interim prime minister in the event of early elections being called. This is seen as a deterrent against the prime minister's Likud party attempting to end the unity early. Netanyahu wants the clause amended, though, to allow him to continue as interim prime minister instead. The Israeli premier arguing that this would protect him from the high court's alleged attempts to undermine his leadership as he faces trial for suspected corruption. At the same time, Netanyahu also reportedly pushing to increase the emergency government's term from three years to a full four. This under concerns that the shortened term gives additional grounds for the high court to annul the unity deal. And Aaron joins me in studio with more. Aaron, great to have you. Thank you so much. So following on from your report, just give us a bit of background. Why has this law been so controversial here in Israel? So it's actually kind of funny that it is so controversial because in 2015, we had a version of the Norwegian law in force here in Israel, and it was very similar to the original letter of the Norwegian law, mm -hmm. in which case a person would, uh, a cabinet minister, would relinquish his position in the Knesset to focus more on the cabinet, on, on his or her position. Mm -hmm. And then the next person, the very next person in the line uh, in that party list, would then be bumped up into the Knesset position. And again, we had a version of that law in 2015, and several ministers, including Naftali Bennett, uh, Avigdor Lieberman, Ari Deri, they took advantage of this law. But the difference between that version, the original version, and the current version that just passed is that if you'll remember, Blue and White, uh, Benny Gantz's Blue and White Party has divided. Mm -hmm. And so the very next person in the list might be from the opposition, from right. the Telim or the Yeshatid Party. Right. And so this version allows the, the cabinet ministers to pick and choose in the list who would take their place in the Knesset. Mm -hmm. And of course there has to be some give and take. There have been some wins and some losses, both for Benjamin Netanyahu and for Benny Gantz. Tell us a bit more. Uh, yeah, so, so again, this would give the ministers more time to focus on their jobs. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the, the pro, because right. obviously you want that. You want the cabinet ministers to be focused in what it is that they're doing without neglecting their Knesset duties. Mm -hmm. That being said, on the other hand, critics will say that, first of all, it'll cost Israel, the Israeli public, about 26 million shekels per Knesset term to, to add these members to the government. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, it would result in, it could result in a vote of no confidence, because, mm -hmm. you know, Israel voted for certain politicians to be in the Knesset. Those are the Knesset members who got in. So that could result in returning to elections. And also, critics of the unity government have argued that Bibi is looking for, or Prime Minister Netanyahu, <laughs> as he's known, would look for ways to maybe renege on the agreement mm -hmm. that he has with Benny Gantz, this unity agreement, uh, and, and cancel and, and maybe take over. And in, in order to pass the Norwegian law, in order for, for Gantz to get the support that he wanted for the Norwegian law, he had to pay for it exactly. by, by arguably, possibly allowing Netanyahu to overturn laws that would uh, 
kick him out of office in the event that uh, he would be given a vote of no confidence. So just bringing it back a little bit, you know, the Blue and White Party are calling this a victory. So just explain mm -hmm. to us why it's a win for the Blue and White Party. Uh, well, so again, for Blue and White, they have most of their ministers, most of the Blue and White uh, Party who made it into the coalition, they're cabinet ministers. Mm -hmm. And so for them, it's, I think only three of their, of their party aren't in the government. And so this would allow them to bring those three, uh, plus several other ministers from other left-wing parties like Labor, mm -hmm. uh, into, into the Knesset. Um, so that's really the benefit there. But the High Court could still strike this down, so it's not a done deal. Tell us more. Absolutely, yeah. Like I said, this could result in a vote of no confidence. The High Court uh, might strike it down because it amends a basic law in Israel that limits the number of politicians in the Israeli Knesset to 120. Mm -hmm. So this effectively uh, goes over that, you know, their head of the, of the High Court and allows more Knesset members to uh, more politicians, really, from the parties to enter the Knesset. Uh, also, they've argued that this violates the spirit of that law, even though it, it, even though it mm -hmm. amended that law, mm -hmm. uh, especially because the limit of 120 is based on historical and, in fact, biblical precedent. Right. All right. Aaron Porras, thank you for that detail. Thank you so much. All right, moving on now. If you're wanting to know when you can fly to Israel once again, the Prime Minister today giving as close as we've gotten to an answer during a press conference with the Greek Prime Minister in Jerusalem today. Take a listen. We are looking now at the possibility of uh, uh, targeting the opening of uh, tourism, uh, in which case Greece and Cyprus will be the first uh, points of destination. And we would like to set August 1st as a target. So Israelis will also be able to travel to Greece from August 1. The Greek Prime Minister, for his part, touting the opportunities for collaboration with Israel in the economic, agricultural and defence sectors. I would like to point out that this is a very strong strategic partnership. Uh, it's solid. Uh, it stands on its own merit. It's not determined by other actors. But it is a relationship that can uh, grow and strengthen still further. But as countries around the world look to reopen and recover from the coronavirus pandemic, the last has not yet been seen of COVID-19 here in Israel. Here's more. A coronavirus outbreak at a major Tel Aviv hospital. 11 in total, three doctors, two nurses and six other staff diagnosed with the pathogen. Reports Ichilov Hospital believes it was spread during mealtimes at work. The health ministry saying 690 medical personnel across the country are in isolation. This after an outbreak at the Tel Aviv Medical Palace nursing home Monday just next to the hospital. One of the 10 who tested positive was hospitalized and has since died. He said to have had complicated pre-existing medical conditions. Making some noise. Thousands of workers in the arts and entertainment industry putting on a show outside the finance ministry in Jerusalem, demanding financial aid for their industry that has for months been devastated by the coronavirus restrictions. <laughs> Quickly disintegrating though into a rumble, with two people arrested after dozens of demonstrators blocked an intersection area disrupting traffic. Meantime, in the early hours of the morning, the Knesset approving a stimulus package for businesses to help bring back workers placed on unpaid leave during the crisis. Companies would get $2,000 per employee that returned to work in June and $1,000 for each worker who came back in May. So it's back to work, but school's not out for summer. The finance ministry is threatening to dock teachers' pay if they refuse to teach for an extra nine days in July to make up for lost class time during the nationwide lockdown. Teachers' unions and the education ministry in a brewing fight over the extension could end up in court. A warning for parents with Maccabi Health Services saying the latest coronavirus spike is dominated by young people, meaning asymptomatic children can endanger their grandparents without realizing it. As of this morning, the figures show an increase of 217 cases in some 24 hours. The death toll still sits at 302. Now, the impact of the coronavirus has been far-reaching. So what kind of an impact is COVID-19 having on cybersecurity, an industry critical for Israel, both economically and, of course, for its intended defence purposes? So for more on that, I'm joined by cybersecurity expert Ram Levy. Ram, a pleasure to have you with us. Now, I know you held, Hi, you were part of and held two, uh, two online video conferences yesterday addressing just this topic. Uh, why is that? What, what kind of an impact is the pandemic providing, or proving rather, to have? Have on the uh, cybersecurity space? Well, interestingly enough, uh, what we saw is that hackers did not go into closure. 
And uh, we actually saw in the beginning of COVID-19 uh, a quite dramatic surge in the amount of attacks. 80% of cybersecurity attacks uh, during the month of uh, April and May were COVID-19 related, meaning uh, scams, uh, phishing attacks, and most importantly, we saw a lot of ransom attacks uh, taking advantage of the fact that companies have moved from working on-premise to working from home. That opened them up and made them vulnerable to attacks, and cyber hackers uh, took advantage of that. And of course, you were one of, of many speakers yesterday. You yourself, though, are an expert in this space. What did you learn hearing from all the other speakers that was surprising to you? Well, I, well I've learned that, that uh, even in Israel, privacy has become very important to us. Uh, what, we, what we saw in the beginning is that we thought in Israel that privacy is less important to, uh, to Israelis than, uh, than in Europe, for example. But actually, people are very worried about uh, what, what the country knows about them, what the state is allowed and not allowed. Can they track us uh, for, the sake, for the sake of national health? Uh, are they allowed to know what they know? Uh, what companies should do with the information that they take from us. Uh, for example, uh, now companies in Israel are required and organizations are required to measure our health and to uh, sign people that they're, uh, uh, that they're healthy and they're not sick. Uh, so that raises a lot of privacy concerns that Israelis are actually starting to worry about it. Mm. And that's quite new because uh, until recently, we weren't really interested in privacy. Certainly. And now we know that in recent times, as you pointed to, more businesses and, of course, government entities have been suffering from cyber attacks. But for business owners, how do you recommend responding to such cases? Well, what we learned from yesterday is that uh, uh, the more you prepare, the less, the, 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 the less, the, the less risk you have. Uh, so if I would give two recommendations, is one, prepare for the worst. Uh, because hackers, they don't discriminate between businesses. They, they do what we call statistic attacks. They're scanning the internet, and if you have a door open, they'll just go in. And second thing, buy insurance. Uh, cyber insurance is not like a regular insurance where the insurer is paying you, is just paying you the money if uh, something has happened. Let's say you had an accident or, or you have a property or, or theft. When it comes to cyber attacks, insurers give, give you actually a lot of value they step in, they bring the professionals, they bring the uh, uh, experts who know how to negotiate, how to recover uh, technically from attacks. Mm. They actually provide a lot of value that if you don't have that, you're going to have to cope with it by yourself. and It's going to be very, very, very expensive. So buy insurance and plan ahead, know, know what you're defending and do the active defense. Mm, better to be safe than sorry. And you mentioned uh, ransoms. What are the basic mistakes that are made while uh, negotiating with attackers who are demanding ransoms? Well, companies don't like to pay naturally. Uh, so when ransom is demanded first, uh, people who don't have experience in, 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 in negotiation, what they do is they start teasing the, uh, the, 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 the hackers. Uh, they refuse to pay. They don't understand that uh, the first thing that we do when we negotiate with hackers is we buy time. We want to understand who the hackers are, what the motivations are. We want to understand maybe we can mitigate the attack without paying. And then we want to find... Um, uh, points of leverage. For example, uh, we can conduct an investigation and at some point we can, if we can get to the hackers, we can tell them, look, if you don't back down, we're going to put the FBI behind you or the police. So if you don't understand that and you don't have the right people behind you uh, doing the negotiation for you and buying time for the technical people because technical forensic investigation takes time. It takes at least 72 hours to understand what's going on and to be able to mm. recover. You can find yourself in a position where the hackers tell you, you know what, if you don't want to pay, I'm just going to delete your entire network. And it happens. Oh, right. And of course, we need to let our viewers know that you don't have to go it alone. There are, of course, experts that can help, uh, that can be consultants around this, people that specialise in helping with such cases. So there are people that Absolutely. you can reach out to to help. Ram Levy, thank you for that insight. Thank you very much. All right, now from the web to the weeds, nations and companies around the world are desperately working on potential treatments and cures for the novel coronavirus. And Israeli medical researchers at Haifa's Rambam Healthcare Campus believe that the latest answer could lie in cannabis. Researchers say the studies are already showing great promise and with further work, they believe the medical grade marijuana can treat COVID-19 patients where conventional drugs have failed. The target patients are those suffering from severe immune responses. Now, the challenge now is just to isolate the best cannabis strains and clinical trials using blood samples from COVID-19 patients are scheduled to begin in the next few months. 
Well, maybe you're coupled up, married or dating, maybe you've ticked the it's complicated box, maybe you're all about the single life, but whatever your status, we're being given insight into the impact that COVID-19 could be having on our relationships. Turns out a peptide called oxytocin produced in our brain is having one of two impacts on us. One, it's bringing our hearts together or it can help induce aggression. So it's a fine line, you see. And now that conclusion has come from Israel's Weizmann Institute of Science, they've been looking at the so-called love hormone a little closer. And PhD student Sergei Anpilov from the Weizmann Institute of Science joins me now with more. Sergei, a pleasure to have you. Now, you have been hey. studying mice living in semi-natural conditions. I suppose you can call the way we've been living during COVID-19 uh, semi-natural or less than semi-natural. What has your uh, research shown? Uh, yeah, indeed, uh, there's quite a few similarities in uh, how we looked at the mice and uh, the latest uh, experience that we had. The findings of our research support the hypothesis that oxytocin is not just acting as a pro-social agent in our brain to make us friendlier, rather it is amplifying the social cues that we get from the people that are surrounding us. So if I meet a person with a friendly face, I will perceive it even uh, friendlier and vice versa. And when we examine the effect of oxytocin on group of mice, uh, which is uh, quite a complex social context, uh, oxytocin can increase uh, not only the social interest or the friendliness, but also aggression among the mice. Mm. And basically the direction of the effect is dictated by the uh, social context that wow. the mice uh, find themselves in. So, I mean, I'm not a scientist, but it makes me think that it's important we're looking after our mental health if it's something that's just enhancing what we're already walking around with. So uh, what can this discovery help psychiatrists with? Um, yeah, translating the findings from mice uh, to humans is a general and a huge challenge. And this is something that is uh, widely known as the translational gap. And I... Uh, Think that studying the behavior in complex social context, which is more relevant to humans uh, rather in uh, simplified interactions of just a pair of mice, is already a substantial step uh, in the right direction, uh, aiming at translatability of the, of the findings eventually. Well, it's really interesting and thank you so much for being with us, Sergey, and for sharing that insight. Thank you. It was a pleasure. All right, well, they're big and they're back. Two sperm whales have been spotted in Israeli territorial waters for the first time since the country's Marine Mammal Centre began its research in 1993. This video of two whales, apparently a mother and a calf, was taken some 4.3 miles off the northern coast of Israel. Divers having a whale of a time with the giants as they swim south. And here's a fancy fact. They're the largest of the toothed whales and males can measure up to 40 two feet, which is about two thirds the length of a bowling lane. All right, well, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Well, I've been in the office all day, but I'm told it's a beautiful day out and we're headed for another one tomorrow. Tel Aviv's low tonight is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 20 degrees Celsius. And tomorrow, if you like the heat, a glorious high of 88 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 31 degrees Celsius. And now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. Well, if you're watching this with your kids, this might be just the encouragement they need to send them off to sleep tonight. Good thing to play them before bed. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> All right, well, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.47 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Tracy Alexander, and thank you so much for watching.